Okay, good morning, everybody. So, uh, as uh, Andre said, uh, our first uh, panel will be about new generation challenges to the security of the Allies. As everybody see, we have a 30 minutes delay, and I hope we'll uh, uh, be on time to finish the, the, the uh, talks and questions. Um, we will talk about uh, matching threats and allied capabilities, addressing terrorism, cyber threats, hybrid warfare, frontier security, and migration. So nothing um, will miss from this uh, important panel. Uh, Andre told me, and as you can see, it's um, open to the press on the record panel. Uh, His Excellency Ambassador Sorin Dukaru, Assistant NATO Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges, will be the first one. Uh, Ambassador, the floor is yours, and uh, we hope that um, NATO will bring us uh, uh, new and interesting ideas for this uh, panel, for this debate. I want to ask you to, to make a, an exercise of uh, analysis, imagination, it's more analysis because you is is not an imagination of science fiction. It's the world we're uh, we're living it. I mean, we do see terrorist attacks. It really it has changed our our lives. I mean, uh, I'm for me in Brussels while driving to my office and seeing smoke from the bombs at the airport is why it was like living again driving to my office at the embassy in Washington and seeing smoke from the Pentagon in 2011. So 2011 was not a unique uh, single place. It's, it's, it's a sense of the, the world we're, um, uh, we're living. And uh, I think it was, that was a wake-up call. Uh, what happens now, it's even more uh, a wake-up call. Uh, it uh, is dangerous. It is a phenomenon that it's still growing at scale. But it's something that uh, we need to, to, to respond uh, through our um, uh, strength. And um, that is the, the capacity to uh, really understand its nature, its scale, to uh, be better in uh, obtaining and sharing the information on, on the causes and uh, those who, who are, uh, let's say, the tactical employers of such uh, attacks and also acting to solve the source in those countries. And frankly, NATO's approach is on all these aspects, you know, better awareness, better intelligence, uh, uh, better sharing, using some of its knowledge uh, of um, uh, counter-terrorism actions, counter-improvised explosive devices, uh, training that uh, NATO has been developed through its operations, like in Afghanistan, where we were heavily under terrorist uh, attacks. So using this also in this environment and actually empowering more uh, the nations that can be source or transit of uh, terrorists to really defend uh, themselves. But again, the, my, my instinct is uh, that we need to not limit ourselves to what we see and not limit ourselves to only see one of the aspects. Uh, one of the, for example, concerns is this, uh, the, the blend between uh, terrorism and cyber uh, threats. Now, terrorists already use the internet as a con- command and control of choice, as somebody would mention. So it, it, for, for recruiting and also for sending the messages, the uh, command, uh, and, and so on. And we have to find the right balance between still preserving the, the, the essential elements of the freedom and uh, privacy within uh, the, the, our, our virtual world, but also capacity not to have it hijacked by, by, uh, by these, uh, these trends. And sometimes this should not be done through intrusive uh, uh, big brother or intelligence. Sometimes this could be done with partnership with industry. Industry itself has some ethics uh, rules the Googles, the Facebooks of the, the, the world, they themselves cannot and should not allow using on their platforms or, or the hijacking of their platforms for, for something like, like that. So beyond of what we are doing and what I mentioned in this field of terrorism and NATO, we should be 
get, getting more involved with the other stakeholders, or with think tank community, with, with industry in, in, in fighting this uh, together. Because otherwise, uh, what we can only anticipate today, what we don't see yet today, can, uh, can happen. Uh, there are other, there's another exercise of imagination uh, that I'm going to, to propose to you. Uh, some are saying that um, if, if the size of the internet today would be comparable to that of a soccer ball or American football ball, in about 30 years it would be the size of a planet. So this is the scale uh, of, of development uh, of this um, cyberspace. So if we see some significant challenges today, and, and um, President Joanna mentioned how uh, uh, cyber attacks could be blent with uh, what is called influence operations or information um, attacks can even affect uh, political machinery in, in some country. I mean, there were cyber attacks during the elections in Ukraine just the, uh, shortly after the, uh, the annexation of Crimea and there's this debate uh, uh, of hacks and influence in the uh, American um, political landscape. Uh, and frankly, no one is immune. Uh, so if this grows at this speed and uh, we, we are um, uh, uh, not responding with the same kind of speed and using our potential to, to, to work in interconnection, um, we won't... Uh, be able to, to cope. Uh, it's, it's like, you know, it's evolving with the speed of light and we are uh, responding with the speed of, uh, you know, maybe law, politics and, uh, and so on. Yes, I mean, these, this democratic system, institutional systems, uh, has a, a different rhythm, but by um, getting a bit more anticipative, more proactive and more connected together, we can use our, our scale to, to, to respond in this, uh, uh, in this way. Then uh, you should uh, be aware of um, the impact of the new technologies upon security at large. Uh, imagine what in the future this proliferation of uh, unmanned uh, capabilities uh, will mean. Uh, we know uh, how important they are, including for uh, threat analysis, for intelligence, reconnaissance, surveillance. Uh, this is a, an important asset that NATO has developed in uh, concert among uh, allies. So this is a great uh, technology to use for the, for the scope of collective dis defense, but we should also be aware of uh, what impact it, it, it could have uh, if it's uh, not used in a, in a virtuous uh, uh, sense. Um, there's technology that um, can affect stability of our stability of security and stability of our space assets. And our life today depends on these assets, uh, our GPSs, our air traffic controls, uh, pretty much everything. Uh, and. Um, this is also to be considered as part of the, let's say, uh, themes. Um, the importance um, of um, bringing, uh, making, making the, uh, the link uh, between uh, these threats and their human impact is uh, key because it's only this way that we can address them at the source. It's only when uh, we can address, uh, for example, uh, terrorism um, at, at its source that we can make sure that we won't uh, have the continuation of this huge challenge of migration that we have today. Yes, we need to respond with what's happening now to mitigate, to not to have human loss and so on, but uh, we need to change the dynamics so that this cannot uh, uh, really um, develop at the same scale also uh, for, the, uh, for the future. So um, while, for example, in themes like migration, uh, NATO doesn't have a, let's say, defined mandate. We, we try to, to, to help in cooperation with um, uh, regional nations, with the European Union, uh, NATO's Aegean, um, uh, mission 
has been uh, one of um, surveillance, reconnaissance, and then conveying the information and the evaluation to Frontex and to the, the, the states that uh, um, uh, are in the front line of, of this crisis, namely uh, mainly t Turkey and, um, and Greece. So we're, we're trying to, to, to do our, um, our, our best to, to be in support, and we would be in support of uh, any um, actor that requires the support from us, be it international organizations or, or, or particular states. Um, but I think even more so, it's the importance to, to address uh, things at their source. There's another aspect that I wanted to mention, and it's not on the list, and uh, it's the still uh, the danger of proliferation of uh, weapons of mass destructions or their precursors, and I'm speaking here of chemical or biological uh, 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 precursors, um, one should not uh, underestimate uh, and, uh, w what, what capabilities there are today with the current technologies, uh, miniaturized labs, that some precursors uh, from uh, Syria or from, uh, from uh, Iraq, uh, uh, how they could be used in actually generating uh, chemical uh, attacks uh, uh, or uh, uh, kind of dirty uh, um, uh, dirty bombs uh, that could be in the hands of uh, um, uh, of terrorists, and uh, from this point of view, uh, I think more um, of a coordination and, and analysis uh, is is key. Um, to uh, to make uh, to make a long uh, story uh, short, I think um, there are a couple of um, key ingredients when we are addressing these aspects. We need to be able to understand them. And what I mean understand them, uh, because all these aspects have sometimes technical ingredients, we need to bridge the, the uh, gap between those who understand the technicalities of, of them and those who are supposed to develop strategies or political decisions. And uh, one should not underestimate the, the, the difficulty of, of filtering out the technicalities, but actually bringing out the essence to the decision makers to take the right, uh, the right action. So awareness and, and understanding. Secondly, uh, this, is an, this is part of asymmetric uh, uh, warfare. And the only way, uh, what, what it means after asymmetric, it, it gives the attacker an advantage. And the only way to respond, because the attacker has the surprise element, the speed element, uh, the, 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 all these advantages, uh, the advantage of the defender is to act in concert, but with some very well-established uh, rules and mechanism to exchange information and action, and sometimes with some pre-approved uh, by the political masters, pre-approved uh, patterns of, of response uh, so that a uh, response can be uh, can be done um, uh, fast uh, i think what nato has done in the cyber domain in this is a really good model because we established a, a network through contact points of sharing actionable information uh, we even established um, uh, information sharing platform with industry of course uh, cyber was also the first domain in which nato and eu have concluded an agreement of information exchange of cooperation that was on cyber. It was in February this year before we had the Warsaw Joint Declaration. And I was told that this was one of the first agreement between the two organizations in about a decade. So this is a good model. You need to have a mechanism of immediate sharing of information, also what to do with it, how to act and how to, to respond. And my last point is don't think that what you see today is exactly what will be tomorrow. Always try to, to anticipate. It's about thinking about options, about scenarios, and then establishing what we call uh, indicators, warning indicators that could actually hint, give you just a hint of which of the scenarios is the one uh, that you need to put more, more resources um, for, for a response. Uh, because it's only uh, through such uh, an approach that uh, can, uh, you, you can really match the dynamics of the threats in this domain. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Dukaru. Uh, showing you and uh, Mircea Joana, um, one of the biggest contributors uh, of Romania joining NATO. 
uh, remembering uh, that in 1994 Romania was the first country to sign the Partnership for Peace. And uh, the speech of uh, Ambassador Ducaro could be considered uh, that time from science fiction division of NATO. But right now it's about clear and present danger. And uh, he said something very important about uh, threats that are becoming more and more real day by day. So uh, I will keep in mind this uh, say of you that uh, there is no science fiction, that terrorism and cyber threats are something from our life. And uh, the landscape of threats, uh, uh, we see uh, in the landscape of threats, uh, threats uh, dramatic changes day by day. I'll give the floor to Dr. Itamara Lockhart, the Senior Research Fellow uh, of U.S. Uh, National Defense University. Itamara, please. So about six years ago, six, seven years ago, we at, um, there was a study that was commissioned by the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. This is public. You can find it online. I can give you the reference afterwards. Looking at the evolving threat landscape and what did it mean in terms of cyber as well as the implications for humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, migration, and all the other things we're discussing today. And what we determined in summary is that this was a non-polar world. So you have actors who have the ability to uh, move and project power in a way that was never thought of before. It's not that the actors have changed. It's not that hybrid warfare is new. It's not that terrorism is new. It's that the technology has changed their ability to do what they do and to equal state level strength. Um, and what we determined is that there was basically, it was coined a 3C environment of collaboration, competition, and conflict, where you can have the same actors who are collaborating, competing, or in conflict at the same time. So for example, US-China. Uh, in certain things we collaborate, other ways we compete, some ways we conflict, and that you needed flexible response. And if you start listening to these terms, a lot of these terms sound like traditional deterrence speak. But it is different from deterrence because deterrence in the nuclear sense was a bipolar world. Um, and so we started looking at what principles can we use from the deterrence world that could possibly apply and what we thought about was, one is penalty, okay? Create laws. If you can create the laws, then you can find a way to counter what's happening. Two, futility. People say, how can you do futility in terms of cyber? Because you don't have attribution, you don't know who's coming at you. Well, if you put an invisible fence, a wire fence, an electric fence around your farm, you can deter something from coming in. You don't have to know whether it's a person, whether it's a fox, what kind of threat is coming in. So it's basically pushing to harden your systems. Um, most of the threats, most of the attacks that occur, I think it was Symantec who came out with the, the um, exact figure was about 98% is human error. So there's a lot that you can counter um, simply by hardening your systems, as well as increasing education. And this is done by Singapore, this is done by Estonia, where I spend quite a bit of time, where all levels of people from kindergarten up are taught what not to do on your phones, on your computers, on other kinds of devices. I still do things I shouldn't do just out of convenience, but there are many ways to mitigate that gap and that opening. Um, another concept is uh, dependency. The more dependent you are on each other, the more likely you will be to cooperate and collaborate. And this is an area where I'm pleased to hear NATO has moved forward in terms of public-private partnership, but it is also an area that needs to be increased in terms of cyber. And counterproductivity. Uh, and the example of this was after the 7-7 attacks, terrorist attacks in London, um, there was a brilliant use of social media where people immediately went out and put three words on their hands, showed it on television, we are not afraid, we will continue. Something to that effect that essentially cut the legs off of the, the terrorist intent to create fear. So there was a good example of how you can use technology in a, a contemporary kinetic setting for counterproductivity. 
And the last was a networked deterrent effect, meaning you need a network. Um, there is no way to address these kinds of threats without networks. So what are the challenges to this wonderful theory? Um, uh, there are many. First is defining cyber. What is cyber? Uh, you have many different definitions. You have many different people who address it in different ways. Um, but we broke it down into basically three things. There's crime, there's intelligence, and there's conflict. So if you're talking about cyber crime or things that deal with stealing money or equipment or information, um, then th there are certain laws that already exist that you simply apply to the cyber domain. Um, if you're talking about intelligence, and this is where it gets sticky, intelligence is not illegal, or conducting espionage is not illegal under international law. Why? Because most countries want to be able to conduct espionage. And so if you're talking about creating norms or legal mechanisms to reduce cyber espionage, that's probably not going to happen simply because the, the, there are no laws, international laws, on traditional espionage. If you're talking about um, uh, what's been called you know, uh, espionage in terms of stealing information from companies, that's crime. That's, that's stealing information from a company for profit. That's not the same thing as a state-level type of espionage. And this is where it becomes very tricky in terms of looking at state actors who are engaging in this kind of behavior and how to counter it, if possible, um, and what are the norms or the bounds that should or should not be around states trying to move in this direction. And the last category is conflict. And so whether it is a, a declared war, whether it is an asymmetric conflict of terrorism and, and gangs and other kinds of things that happen, these actors do use technologies. And not only do they use them for command and control, but they also use them to attack, to get intelligence, to do information operations. Um, they work alone. They work in concert with other groups. They work with state actors, which makes it very sticky and very difficult to counter well. Um, I would also say, in terms of the complicating factors, apart from the definitions and the blurring of actors, there have been new laws now in Europe where you have the right to be forgotten, where people don't want their personally identifiable information to be gathered online. Um, and this has made it challenging for those in intelligence or even pure academia who have been using social network analysis, data scrapers, other things to kind of assess and analyze what's happening, who's using what. Um, but there, is, there are ways and there are tools that still allow for that privacy while gathering big metadata. Um, and this is, these are academic tools, these are not government tools um, that I'm speaking about. Um, but it does make it difficult um, in terms of moving forward. Uh, the other big complicating factor is influence operations. It's been highlighted a few times in terms of how it's impacted politics, different elections. But again, this is not new. It's not just with the recent US elections that this came up. This happened in, in the Estonian elections long ago. It happened in other elections. There were other tools. Maybe it wasn't called cyber, but it was done. And so the, the reason I, I emphasize that is to demystify, if you will, um, because so many people say we can't get our arms around this. This is impossible. This is too big or re will require too many assets but I do feel that you can apply certain lessons from the past. Um, academia, uh, as I said, uh, has helped and hurt this debate. There, is, uh, there was a big push for something called cyber terrorism, which made everyone very confused of what is cyber terrorism. Is it terrorist use of cyber, which is something very specific? Is it an incident that occurs in cyber that could equate uh, uh, an Article 5 in terms of a terrorist attack? And it made the conversation and the discussion very murky because different people didn't know what we were talking about. And I found that think tanks, actually, and the discussions in the NATO centers of excellence have been the most fruitful in moving this conversation forward um, and have been able to uh, address this in a better way. So what have been the responses? So in terms of, uh, I believe it was the, the Wales summit where it was determined, Wales or Chicago summit, that an Article 4 would happen in case one of the allied members would be facing a, an attack and would want assistance from NATO. So 
that doesn't mean that every time an attack or an incident happens that immediately NATO goes into, into power. Because if you look at it, the United States is attacked all the time. Uh, France is attacked all the time. Estonia is attacked every day. So it, it's not the first resort. Um, and for those who are not aware, an Article 4 means that you have a, a congregation of the members who determine at that time whether or not the incident um, equates to an Article 5 response. So it's not the immediate thing, because immediately you have to counter and deter in other ways. Um, what I found interesting uh, from the Warsaw Summit was that there was a determination that humanitarian law um, can be applicable to uh, cyber incidents. But again, there is no definition on what is a cyber incident, what is an act of war in cyber, um, and there is no clear international law on cyber. There are many opinions, there are many different points of views, but international law is made by states and so far we haven't reached that yet. So that's an area we're getting to. Uh, other responses have been um, also in terms of crime, a lot of cooperation between um, Europol, uh, between SOCA, that's the UK Serious Organized Crime Association, and that's changed its name a few times. Um, they determined why should we worry about which actor it is, whether it's intelligence, whether it takes so long to figure out the attribution and the, and the motivation behind it, that they determined instead that they would simply collect the information if they thought it was relevant, and if they determined that it wasn't for the UK or if it was for another government or for another agency, they would then just pass it along with a nice little packet. And that was the way that they have moved ahead and it's actually been quite uh, effective. Um, another thing I'll mention is just collaborative efforts. There are, I mentioned it at dinner for those of us who were at the same table, there are many mill-mill um, military to military familiarization exercises that are sponsored by UCOM. And I participated in the first few uh, dealing with cyber, the first few years dealing with cyber. And so we take a state from uh, the United States. We have partners with various countries. Um, we did it with Estonia, with country Georgia, with Latvia, with Lithuania. And basically a sharing of, of information, um, not intelligence because that gets sticky, but a, a, a sharing of best practices, if you will. And we learned from other states too. So for example, the Estonians have a civilian defense force where they bring in civilians to help defend against the network. Um, and they cannot be deployed overseas, um, but nonetheless, they are uh, essentially bringing in their private sector expertise to the table, which has been incredibly useful um, to the point that we even started mitigating and, and creating a similar uh, uh, program, if you will, in the United States, and I commanded that first unit. Um, other areas of cooperation have been, uh, I've noticed since the Warsaw Summit, in terms of public affairs for NATO, um, in getting the word out and using social media more about what is NATO, what are these threats, what are we doing in terms of, of defense or deterrence or support. Um, that has had some mixed response. Some people are, aren't used to seeing new things from NATO showing up on Facebook um, or Twitter. Um, however, for the most part, it's been well received. The difficulties and the challenges have been what levels, uh, is it simply the, the aspect of public affairs to send out the message? How do you measure how effective it is? How do you keep that clear from intelligence? Uh, operations versus simply marketing and public affairs. And so that simply takes some time to figure out um, in terms of coordination and cooperation. But those have been the issues so far. And uh, other things have been the exercises. I would argue that NATO has gone very far in terms of exercising to look at hybrid impacts as well as cyber incidents. Lock Shields has been very, very successful. However, bringing in more industry during that during these exercises would be very helpful. Um, likewise, bringing in the aspect of social media or regular media to see how things play out in the real world because this is an element that is incredibly powerful and useful um, and we don't usually exercise these out um, in, in small settings. And likewise, the technical exercises tend to be by techie people um, and techie people don't um, 
understand the strategic elements, as, as Ambassador uh, Ducaro said, um, and likewise, the strategic leaders don't understand the technical elements. And so trying to exercise that part of it, that interface, Naval Postgraduate School has done some wonderful things with something called Mowgli, um, multi, uh, massively multiplayer online war game leveraging the internet. It's, it's M-M-O-W-G-L-I. Um, as well as some other types of real world exercises that you can play on your phone or your tablet, and it's a game. It's not three, you know, three days of multiple people in a room just behind computers. Um, and it's injecting multiple real time uh, assessments as well as uh, assessments from the press and industry so that you can respond in a more realistic fashion um, that can hopefully give you uh, a better solution. And the last kind of hopeful point I'd, I'd say is if there have been a lot of, you know, with all the, the negative aspects of cyber and, and its implications for hybrid warfare and other kinds of threats and WMD as well, um, CBRN, there are also tremendous advances that have been done in humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. And that is something that is not only useful for in terms of uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, um, in terms of being able to understand what kind of populations are moving, what kinds of uh, migration is happening with animals, uh, what's happening in terms of, of uh, movement of ships, uh, looking at the environment, uh, whether rivers are drying. These are all very useful tools in terms of understanding the threat landscape and responding to it better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lockhart. <laughs> Dr. Lockhart, you provoked me by saying that since we are kids, we are learning what not to do. Can this be a new concept in NATO, what not to do in terms of cyber threats? Because if we are learning what not to do, we can prevent future crises in terms of cyber uh, defense. We have nice and very valuable uh, concepts like need to know, like lessons learned. In terms of cyber attacks, uh, what not to do seems to me a very, very wise uh, says of you. Well, so that's why I brought up the example of Singapore. And the reason Singapore decided to go into this direction is that Singapore didn't have the defense structure or the finances, interestingly enough, to engage and create a huge cyber capability equal to, say, the US or some other big powers. And they determined that having, uh, because all Fortune 500 companies have a base in Singapore, they saw themselves as a prime target for cyber crime. And because of where they're located geostrategically, there are many um, terrorist groups that are in that region. So they saw themselves as a just prime target. And they started literally from kindergarten up training you what not to do. Uh, granted, the, the laws in Singapore are very clear. Um, they may not be what all countries would choose. Uh, but for example, if you go onto a banking website or um, a critical infrastructure website, an energy website, it says very clearly, if you hack into the system, then you will. And it spells out the penalty. So part of the issue in, in many countries looking at this have been, what if it's a teenager? What if it's someone just trying to impress their girlfriend or they're bored? Or, or these kinds of things, is, does that, should that person have the same kind of penalty as, say, a terrorist or a state actor that's trying to do this? And this it negates that entirely because it's there. It's clear. There's no way you don't know. The state has made its responsibility by telling people, and it's actually pretty cheap. Um, it's far less expensive to train people um, on basic cyber hygiene is what it's called. You don't need to know all the technical things. Just don't do this when you're at a Starbucks or at a coffee shop. Don't do this when you're at an airport or at a hotel. Um, these are the things to watch out for when you get X type of emails. Um, and to have it happen on a regular, continual basis across all fields, not just military and intelligence um, or diplomatic corps. Thank you, Dr. Lockhart. Uh, Ambassador Ducaro, will you tell us what not to since do? You, since you asked the question about what NATO is doing, I should tell you that no one can operate at NATO on a, any of the systems, and we have two systems. One is the business network, uh, uh, and the other one is the highly classified one. 
until he or she passes a, a test. So you have a course online, which you can follow in an hour or two, and then you have a test. And it's only after you have a test, you can actually log in. And the test is about what not to do, mostly. Because, and how not to get tra be trapped by spear phishing and so on and so forth. And then we have a security awareness program where there, there are updates of what kind of different kind of uh, potential um, attacks you, you should be careful. One of the simple rules is uh, you frankly do not respond to an email from uh, somebody you do not know unless somebody, th that email is not introduced by somebody you know. It's a simple uh, rule. Or if you see, the, see there's something interesting, it might be something interesting, it might be an invitation from a think tank that you don't know. You make sure that it's tested, the source, by your colleagues in IT, and then it's safe. And then they, they, they give you back. It's not that complicated. Uh, and I think this should be starting, uh, it's true, from, from kindergarten. And I know that uh, Augustin Giano with Romanian CERT and the uh, Ministry of Education and so are thinking about this in this country because I think uh, cyber hygiene should be exactly like normal hygiene. I mean, if you wash your hands every day, you, teach, you, <laughs> you brush your teeth and you teach this when you're in kindergarten, you should really be taught how to handle uh, the, the internet since kids of three years really are online these days. Yes, it's not, uh, it's not the big things, the rules, but uh, we need to apply more strictly because I heard uh, a few days ago that the last threat was a uh, NATO fake email sent to the German Ministry of Defense. So... Uh, I, I can tell you, uh, tell you about this. It's, it's, uh, it's the new... Uh, it was uh, a, a trend, actually, this, this summer of uh, faking, spoofing uh, NATO dot int uh, addresses. And, um, you know, it's, you can, NATO can seize when something like this happens, where such a fake address is, tries to connect with a NATO address. And then the NATO centralized protection immediately sees is not a legitimate uh, uh, input. And we actually inform everybody else. But if that fake address enters some other systems and it, it looks legitimate and it even has a subject which might be interesting, it you know, uh, lures somebody else to to actually uh, click. So, at the end of the day, this uh, education of really do not click until you know who that person it is, even it, if it might have a, an interesting uh, domain, a legitimate domain, but the person itself was not legitimate. It was a fake uh, address created by the attacker through social uh, engineering to get to, to, to different networks. And uh, it happens from other domains um, as well, so we need to be careful about this. Very useful examples, thank you. Uh, Dr. Lohar said that we need to connect to network and to work uh, connected to network, and he's, she said also what not to do. The best person to tell us what not to do when we are connected to a network is the next speaker. Uh, Florin Cosmoiu, Director of National Cyber Intelligence Center, Romanian Intelligence Service. You have the floor. Thank you. It's uh, very hard to, to say what not to do, to be uh, sure that uh, you are not infected. I think that uh, the only way to uh, don't be infected is to not to connect to the network <laughs> because uh, even uh, we make in many institutions uh, awareness uh, as uh, Ambassador Ducaro said you can receive uh, a spoof mail that seems to be from a legitimate person and uh, you can be infected so uh, in this domain, the threats uh, that we are facing uh, all the days, all the time, are uh, coming from uh, uh, many directions. First of all, uh, we can um, say that uh, our uh, state-sponsored attacks that uh, are targeting, uh, uh, let's say, uh, strategic uh, institution from a country, also critical infrastructures, and uh, uh, these attacks uh, 
are happening all the days, also in Romania. We are a target from state sponsor attacks because we are NATO members and are EU members and uh, uh, some states that are doing the, uh, these attacks are targeting also Romania. Uh, they want to, to steal strategic information from Romania and uh, also uh, target our critical infrastructures. Uh, this year we have a very good uh, examples that uh, happen in Ukraine uh, where uh, um, the power supply was uh, cut off from uh, a big region in uh, Ukraine. Uh, such a thing could happen also everywhere in the, the world. And uh, from this reason, uh, in Romania, the state tried to, to increase uh, the capabilities to, to protect uh, uh, these critical infrastructures. Uh, also, uh, criminal uh, attacks are happening uh, all the days in Romania. Uh, recently, this year and last year, uh, the criminal gangs uh, are targeting also uh, financial system, a banking system also in Romania. Uh, and uh, also we have uh, and uh, we are facing all the days the cyber terrorism attacks and the extremist attacks. These kind of attacks are uh, uh, now not very uh, sophisticated. The capabilities of uh, these uh, attacks are uh, in uh, these days low, but uh, we have to, to look at this uh, uh, phenomena because uh, uh, they try to, to increase their capabilities. Uh, these uh, are our challenging in uh, our days and uh, Romania uh, has uh, more programs to, to increase uh, their technical capabilities. Also, we have a lot of cooperation with NATO we are participating uh, with NATO at the uh, Smart Defense Program, at the uh, cyber, uh, uh, cyber exercises, and uh, also to, to cyber education. Okay, I think. Thank you, Mr. Cosmoyo. Uh, um, it will be a provocation for uh, Augustin Giano, General Director of National Response Center for Cybersecurity Incidents, to tell us if we can allow not to connect on a network in terms to prevent any cyber attack, like Mr. Cosmoyo said, or could you give us an advice, what can we do, do connected to a network to prevent any cyber incidents? Uh, President Obama once said, or I think in uh, several occasions said that cyberspace is uh, the Wild West. And I think that we should let, let that really sink in, what the Wild West really means and what it meant. Um, so there's people online doing all sorts of crazy things, hijacking people's money, hijacking people's files uh, for all intents and purposes. And there's not much that one can do about that. So in order for us to, to know where we're going, where, where we want to go, we need to first acknowledge where we are. Uh, for this, I propose a thought experiment. Um, if, if we were 
uh, say, a malevolent actor, doesn't matter, country or you know, terrorist group, uh, would we go targeting highly protected uh, military infrastructures in order to cause some damage? Or would we target essential service providers? Would we target people in their homes to spread terror? And the reality is that it's much easier to target uh, the commercial sector, public sector, and, uh, and people, citizens, than to attack uh, military agencies and military networks that are highly pro protected and uh, have uh, specific uh, security policies. So we need to acknowledge uh, that at this point that there's millions of infected devices across the world, hundreds of millions, millions of them in Romania, that are part of botnets. And these are devices and computers of our citizens that are infected and controlled by others, by malevolent actors, and are used against us. And this is happening daily. They even charge money for this. It's a on-demand service that you can buy. You can rent a botnet and attack someone for a couple of hours or a couple of days, depending on how, many, how much money you have. So this is one of the things that we need to acknowledge. Civilian infrastructures are highly targeted, highly uh, vulnerable right now, and um, it's, uh, the, 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 the next step would be the essential service providers. You don't need to attack government or military. They do. They do it for intelligence purposes. But in order to create mayhem and chaos, all you need to do is uh, cut off the uh, water supply or the power supply. And if you think that is, is far-fetched or is a sci-fi scenario, I'll just go back to the example that um, Mr. Kozmoyu gave in the Ukraine last year on uh, December 23rd, so right in the, the brink of Christmas, 225,000 people suffered from a massive blackout that was caused by a cyber attack. This is fact. You can research it online. The SANS Institute has done a wonderful white paper on this. It's TLP white, so you can, you know, find it online, and you can check out the facts. Um, so what, what, what can we do? I don't know about what, what NATO can do, and I don't know about what, uh, what the military can do. We're a civilian agency of the, the, the Romanian government, and uh, the only thing that I can uh, say is what we can do. What we as a, as a government, as an agency, and as a country can do. And this is, um, this is, honestly, we need to have some legislation. As, uh, we cannot no longer keep up with the threats. We need to have some laws and specific criteria that, uh, unfortunately, we'll have to enforce a minimum level of security. And uh, the European Commission and the European Parliament and the Council agree because they, uh, they adopted this uh, July this year, the European uh, Network and Information Security Directive, which states specifically this. So at some point, the Commission said, okay, we're moving too slow. So awareness is great, under raising awareness and, and understanding is, is needed, but we're moving too slow. And uh, the next steps that we, we have to do, so what would do we gain with, the, with the, in this directive? So first of all, we gain visibility. We get to see all attacks that target essential services and digital service providers. So we get to see what's happening. So let's take, for instance, an example. If I were a firefighter in a city, if no one calls the fire brigade to extinguish a fire, then you know, everything can burn down because people don't see cyber attacks as they see fires. You need special sensors to do that. Uh, cyberspace is, uh, is in some ways is uh, similar to physical space. We can make all sorts of analogies, but in some ways is, is very much different. And visibility is, is the first thing that we need to have. 
The second thing that we need to have and that this directive provides is coordination. And third, but most important, is the minimum uh, level of security across the EU. Um, so what I propose uh, and what I will do uh, with the CERT is open up um, discussions and public consultations with all, um, uh, all essential service providers and digital service providers and all other uh, stakeholders in government, in academia, in the private sector to see how we can uh, implement national legislation uh, to be, to be in, in line with the directive. Um, uh, Itamara said that 90% um, of, of uh, incidents were caused by human error. And this is one thing that we need to understand when it comes to understanding and awareness. Most people don't understand that systems, information, security, information technology systems, are made of hardware, software, procedures, and people the users that operate the systems. So we need to focus a lot of attention on awareness and it's, uh, it's uh, some of the things that we've done lately, focus a lot on awareness and on, on uh, uh, cyber hygiene and to, to address uh, what uh, Ambassador Dukaro said, we do have a project in the works that we've, uh, we've uh, written with the help from NGOs. Uh, we've also consulted with the uh, uh, Cyber Int Center and we've proposed it to the Ministry of, on, of Communications and Information Society, also to the Ministry of Education, and that we want to, to help implement in Romania that address specifically cyber hygiene, which is uh, simple stuff for, for children in uh, gymnasium and high school to understand what not to do online. And it's basic stuff. It's not all that complicated. And teachers don't need specific skills to teach this. They just need to... Uh, maybe uh, once, every, uh, once in a month play a movie clip or something for kids. Uh, there's all other sorts of activities that we can do, but I just wanted to address that and say that uh, we're working hard, but uh, we have very, very limited uh, resources. So um, I think this is, uh, this is it on my behalf. So I'm uh, open to dialogue because I like it more than monologue. <laughs> and. Uh, Please ask as many questions as you Thank as you, you Augustin Giano. Uh, you said you begin your speech with uh, quoting President Obama about uh, the Wild West, which is uh, the, 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 the Internet and the cyberspace. What about the Wild East? I mean, we are talking daily about threats, about cyber attacks. What about the Wild East and its uh, uh, occupation on doing these uh, uh, threats daily to the Wild West. Well, it's an easy answer. The internet has no borders. So whatever you know, the Wild East wants to do actually creates the Wild West, the, the metaphor that Obama used. Because um, most of the criminal activity comes from, from countries that haven't uh, signed uh, the Budapest Convention. So there you have it. So n There's no, as, as was said before, there's no international law on cybersecurity, but the space itself, uh, the cyberspace, is international. So there's, there's the conundrum. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is uh, Radu Dorchoman, State Secretary with the Ministry of Communication and Informational Society. Secretary of State, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting us uh, here. The Ministry of Inequality of the regulator of this domain, of cyber domain in Romania. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I get a point from, from, this, from this, uh, these discussions. Uh, what not to do? I just not told my son what not to do and he, he destroyed my laptop, my home laptop. So I don't have one. I have to buy one. And, um, okay, I'm not very happy with, with this, but uh, these threats can be anywhere. Internet, it's, 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 it's anywhere. It's in my office, it's in my house, it's in our houses. It's in, uh, I don't know, uh, in the nuclear central uh, plants or wherever. And that's, uh, therefore, the, the threat is everywhere. We can be, we can be target of, of an attack from Daesh or an, an attack 
for, from from the our uh, adolescent in neighbor that do not like uh, uh, our car. S things like 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 this can happen. So, uh, uh, as much as sophisticated the the, the means of uh, of getting on internet on, and the the, uh, the the technology evolved, uh, that means. Uh, they can have access. The dark side of the internet have have access to the the same the same kind of resources resources and attack us. Uh, the Ministry of Communication and uh, Information Society uh, start uh, at, at the beginning of this year the process of uh, uh, improving modifying the the law of cybersecurity in Romania. As you well know, uh, the law was uh, banned la last uh, last year with the 17th decision of the Constitutional Court uh, due to some some irregularities, and now it's uh, we we start the process the process of public consultations. Uh, we invite the public sector, the business sector, and also the the NGOs to this uh, to these uh, discussions. We also have uh, our colleagues from CERT. Um, I, I will make here a bracket. I salute the, the initiative of CERT of uh, making uh, public awareness about these uh, cybersecurity cyber security issues in high schools and in, in, in Romanian schools. Closing the bracket, I'm continuing with the law. Uh, now, we, uh, we, after three rounds of, uh, of uh, consultations, we uh, finally get a, a version, a final version of the law, which now is under the, the approval of the, of, of, of the government. Some modifications were made, and the, the, the process is uh, it's again started. What, uh, what we want to do with this law, we try to keep a good balance between, uh, you know, uh, the public uh, intima the, the user intimacy and the, the the process of responding to the to, to the cyber threats uh, what i can say uh, mr ducaro uh, ambassador ducaro says said about uh, mentioned about democracy and how we can how we should uh, protect ourselves Against threats, unfortunately, uh, our liberties and our all these these this, this values that we share together with the Western society can be threat, can be can be threat attacked on the on this online environment by anyone, and this is why uh, we should find a way to to adapt because they can change. They can change the, the attack, they can change the threat, they can change the, 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 the using of, of, of the technology to, to attack. We should be able to respond in time and not to respond but to, to, to prevent. Thank you very much. It's, it's a thank you, State Secretary. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers for this interesting panel that we can call the What Not to Do panel. Um, Augustin Giano said that uh, some cyber attacks uh, are looking to cut the supply of water and energy. We don't want to cut your supply of coffee, especially that uh, many of us need dramatically. But we can take uh, a few questions. So, uh, Chairman, President Mircea Giano, and then uh, the, the European MP, Doro Franzulica. Chairman, please. You guys scared me to death, so... Um... <laughs> I was really, I knew, I was talking to the, to the Admiral here, I remember uh, Admiral Mullen saying in one conference that as Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of the largest military in the history of the planet, that he spent 60% of his working time on cyber related issues. In the US, the Pentagon is the lead agency on this thing. But what I've been seeing, now I speak as a, as a public figure, more or less. In the last period of time, and I know there was funding for political parties from the outside, but what I see today in the US, and I think it's coming everywhere, uh, a targeted 
uh, cyber attack on the personal files and the public and private communication of the public figures in a broad sense of the term. And then they're exposed to the media. So it's becoming a political tool. I have friends in the US Congress and US Senate that are returning to the flip phones of some 20 years ago. Some others, like, like, uh, like you, sir, uh, are just giving up on using any kind of communication. So I think we are, other than the, it's the, the fact that we, are, we should target uh, the groups or the governments, Chinese, Russian, others, and I think this is the work of professionals. But there is also a problem of the public domain and the conversation about the balance between control and security and public freedom. And this is an issue that I believe will become, other than the critical infrastructure, all these things that you are the professors of, I feel that we are entering uh, a game of trying to influence the conversation about the essence of democracy and the commanding heights of the intellectual debate that the West has been dominating for 500 years. I think it's not only about espionage or cyber or deterring or crippling nations or critical infrastructures. It's something which is, has become a tool that has an ideological and a, uh, an essence that I've never seen before. Uh, if I'm wrong, please correct me. But I, I really feel something that is, is going into something which is far more structured than the Wild West. Um, that uh, Mr. Giano so eloquently referred to, as Obama said. So I think we are entering a stage where self-censure uh, or the incapacity of any decision maker is not only politicians. It's TV uh, anchors, it's uh, CEOs, uh, presidents of universities, name it, members of European Parliament. Dora von Zulika is here. Um, so this is something I wanted to ask, what, what's going on here? Is it just an empirical thing, is just a, or is something that you believe is part of a grander plan? This is something that, I'm not running for Senate anymore, so I'm not bothered by that thing personally, but I think this is something in the making that we should be very concerned about. You know, there are more and more um, uh, Eurosceptical political parties that are members of the European Parliament. And their members are taking the floor in the plenary, praising, you know, a certain country and a certain leader, and praising closer relationship of the European Union with that respective country. At the same time, you know, we see more and more Eurosceptical European parties that are receiving subsidies from the same uh, uh, country, which is undermining, you know, the European cohesion, European unity, European security at the end. Look what's going on in the last years that the, lots of old and new non-governmental organizations are praising, you know, a, a closer uh, European unity and a less relationship with the United States or uh, non-governmental organizations that uh, are attacking, you know, the, the Brussels uh, bureaucracy and the need for more liberty in Europe. At the same time, uh, non-governmental and also mass media, lots of mass media magazines or newspapers that are, uh, you know, fighting against TTIP or uh, CETA or other transatlantic uh, uh, strong uh, uh, enhanced relationship. This is part, ladies and gentlemen, of, of the hybrid world. This is part of weakening the European Union and uh, uh, we have to analyze closely what will happen when this Brexit is going to take place. This is going to weaken the European Union. European Union needs to, to be supported, uh, not only by the European Union countries, but also by the United States, by Canada, by other strategic partners of the European Union. Because, because without the European Union, we are going to face chaos, you know, uncertainty and threats in Europe. That's why we need the European Union and we need, you know, to reunite our democratic and liberty uh, uh, forces, you know, uh, uh, more than ever, you know, to promote our values uh, and our interests uh, within the world. And uh, it goes without saying that, you know, without UK, 
Europe is going to be uh, weaker, weaker because UK was the main, you know, security and defense contributor to, to the uh, common security and defense policy of the European Union. Then all these things has to be analyzed very closely and uh, at the same time we have to work together to, to face them. Thank you. Thank you, Dorfun Zulika. Thank you very much.